this morning on this great Lord's Day, and as we sing and praise the name of Jesus, we got a lot to be thankful for, amen? amen. So we have a lot to praise the Lord for. So again, it's good to see our first time guest with us this morning. Welcome to Believer's Fellowship. We're so glad that you're here, and uh, Bart, we hope you're already enjoying the worship and praise the Lord, and uh, as you came in at the Welcome Center, you should have received a little connection card. Uh, if you take a few moments to fill that out for us, we'd appreciate it. At the end of the service, we'll tell you how to take that card, and we'd like to exchange it for a free gift for you being our very special guest today. So just hang on to that. We'll kind of remind you at the end what to do with that. But we want to welcome you here, and if you are a first-time guest here at Believer's Fellowship, you just uh, relax and remain seated right where you are. And if our members, regular attenders, will find people around them, behind them, beside them, and just give everybody a big hug around you and welcome our guests and everybody else to the service. So if you would, stand up and welcome those around you as we sing.
want you to just put it down. Because fear does not have a hold on you. Because we're children of God. Amen? continue with that today. In fact, the subtitle of this message is uh, Limiting God, because I really believe in the long line of things and all the things we can look at, what revival, what hinders revival, it certainly kind of puts it in a nutshell. In fact, we'll look at five things in a moment out of Psalm 78. Psalm 78 is one of those great passages in Psalms, one of the longer Psalms, but it's history. It's the history lesson of the children of Israel. From Jacob on, where God is dealing with them, he delivers his word to them, takes them all the way to the present day of where they were at the time. And it's certainly a history lesson that's, uh, I mean, it's pretty synonymous with the language of believers today, how we can go through our own little cycles of uh, needing God to move and having a crisis in our life, getting desperate for God, seeing a manifestation of God, walking with God, and then later on back, just falling back to the same old bad habit of things and needing another crisis in our life to get us paying attention to God again. Psalm 78 is a great story, and one of the things it talks about in there is, is that not only should you know these things, and you should learn these things, but it goes on to say, in the chapter, beginning of the chapter, you need to teach these to your children, and to teach them to your grandchildren as well. So I would encourage you to look at Psalm 78 in your own time. I'm only going to look, focus on four verses in this passage today, but it is a chapter which is, it's a good read. It would do well for you to take some time and look at it and see if there's any similarities in your own walk in your own spiritual life. I think, if we'll be honest, you'll probably find some as well. So, praise the Lord. Open the Bible with me to Psalm 78. I'm, like I said, I'll pull these four scriptures up on the screen, but uh, you can see there's about four I want to focus on as we talk about revival matters. It's not working up here, so maybe it'll work back there. Try to follow along. Psalm 78, verse 41 and 42 says, Yea, they turned back. Go ahead and click it for me. They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And they remembered not His hand, nor the day when He delivered them from the enemy. There you have a pretty simple outline of what the problems were. Uh, you see where we get even the sermon title here, for, where they limited. They said they just forgot what God had done to miss and how He delivered them at one time. So you just have to kind of stay with me because that will not work. All right? Psalm 78, verse 57 and 58 says this, But they turned back, and they dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. For they provoked him to anger with their high places, and they moved him to jealousy with their graven images. We'll talk a little bit about 
that in a moment. Because we've talked about this whole issue of revival. We talked about how in history, how God did these great marvelous things and how he moved, I mean, just phenomenally. We talked about these extraordinary moves of God through history. Every time you just look and see the times when God just invaded history. We talked about the 17th century revivals and the great prayer awakenings and other great awakenings through history. And we see God just did these phenomenal things. I mean, it was just powerful. I mean, during the Welsh revivals, the Hebrides revivals. In the Welsh revivals, uh, there was a time there when the, the Welsh miners, they said, God had moved so much that all these miners were getting saved. And in the mines, they were back, they didn't have mechanical cars and stuff. They had mules that worked down there and would haul the coal out. They said that they had to literally retrain the mules because the revival was so intensive. Uh, the mules didn't know what to do anymore because all their orders were followed with expletives. But when the miners got saved, their language changed. They had to retrain the mules how to work. So that's a move of God, amen, when you've got to even retrain the mules. You know, we, we, we long for those days. I hope you do. We see God do something in our nation and in our land like we've seen in times past. God, do it again. We know you can. But I think sometimes in this modern culture that we live in, you read those stories like that. And you see what they're saying, but you're not really convinced that we, God might want to do that again or that God could do it again. Please understand, we talked about the immutability of God last week. Remember that God is always the same. He's always for what he's been for, always against what he's been against. God is the same yesterday, today, forever and ever. Amen. God doesn't change. So let me put it this way. If God was for revival then, he's for revival now. Amen. I believe God wants to do something in our midst. So we literally have to overhaul our little feeble thinking, I believe, in the church today, or even in our own personal walk in life. You're going to have to get rid of what they call stinking thinking, you know? Where you just, your, your attitude about revival and about God moving in revival is going to have to be mechanically adjusted for you, all right? In your own mind, you're going to take measures, and you're going to have to fix that because I believe that God still does want to move in our midst today. There's another passage in 2 Chronicles that ought to give you a clear picture of this. That the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those, what? Whose heart is pure. So what is God saying here? Well, God is still looking throughout the whole earth. God's eyes are roaming across the earth today. I believe God's eyes are roaming through this auditorium in our worship center today. And yes, you folks in the lobby, he's roaming down there too, all right? Wherever you are, maybe you're watching on the live broadcast today, but hey, wherever you are, the eyes of the Lord are looking for someone that he can show himself mighty towards. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking, hey, over here, you know, what about me? Well, what's, the, what's the pretty simple prerequisite there whose heart is pure? So I, I, I might surprise you to realize that today God wants to do something in you. God wants to do something in our church. God wants to do something in your individual life. And we may not see, by the way, this global revival. I may not live that long. You might not. It might not happen for Jesus comes today. I don't know. But even though we do not see it, or if we do not see it, it does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that you cannot see a revival in your own life. Amen. But you can return to that place in your own heart and life you see an extraordinary move of God in your life where the mountains are torn down and the freedom comes in your life and you've got victory again and you're walking with God the way that God wants to, you to walk in your life. It is the will of the Father to express himself through your life. That's what he wants to do. He says he's looking to do that. It's his will. And, and if you realize what that means, that means that when I got saved, it wasn't just to get me out of heaven, or get me into heaven and out of hell, but it was for God to get in me right here, right now. Because the real essence of my salvation, ultimately, is just what we're talking about, the manifestation of God's presence. That's why the scripture says, for me to live is what? It's Christ. In other words, where I am, who is there also? Jesus is there. So that wherever I am, Jesus is there. This was the whole, the whole intent from the beginning of creation. That God said he created a man, made him his image and his likeness, all right? And wherever Adam was and wherever Eve was, there, that's where God was. They were an extension of God's presence, and that's what we are. So it is important for us to really believe that God can and will move in our life. And it is important that we begin to realize who we really are and that we are to be that manifestation of God's presence. And God is to be seen in us, through us, with us, around us, on us. I mean, we have this little cute verse, and it's not just cute, it's powerful when we realize what it's saying. 
from the book of Esther where we say, for such a time? Yes. Well, in our leadership dinner, we change that to call it, it's time. All right? <laughs> this is the time that God is doing something in the earth. Just open the newspaper. Watch the accounts that unfold before us on the Internet. I mean, the world's going through one crazy thing after another. It's almost like convulsions are taking place with earthquakes and catastrophes and threats of war and rumors of war and North Korea and their nuclear crisis and the Iranians launching missiles yesterday, all this stuff that goes on every day around us. Are we getting just kind of so inundated with it we don't realize it anymore? But these are, these are, these are critical days. These, these are incredible days at the same time. And God saved you, and God placed you in this generation, at this time, on the planet, in history, for a specific reason. And ultimately, it was to do that very thing, to manifest his life and presence through you. Revival is when we get back to that place where God is really manifesting his life in me, through me, and using me the way he wants to use me. It's not about me just coming to church every Sunday instead of once a month. <laughs> it's not about me cracking my Bible open occasionally to see what it has to say. It's about me falling in love with Jesus and realizing, hey, God is moving on the planet today, and I don't want to miss out on it. Amen. We serve a right now God, so right now I need to get in on what God's doing. Amen. And if we'll get serious, and we'll come to the place that these issues and these matters of revival are important because revival matters. And so I need to get my heart and my life in a state of revival, whatever that means and whatever it takes, to get back on my knees, get back in God's presence and to see God, to make whatever commitments needed to be made in my life to get to the place where God is doing what we just say here, for me to live as Christ. And that's not just religious hyperbole and verbiage. It's a reality because Jesus is being seen to me. When that happens, if that happens, we become, at that time and at that moment, in that place, a very radical force that has to be dealt with. The world doesn't really know how to handle fired-up Christians. They didn't know how to handle it in the beginning. They don't know how to handle it now. But what it means is that you and I come back to the place, well, we call this church Believer's Fellowship. We need to be believing Believer's Fellowship. We need to be believers that are really believing God for something and trusting God. It's imperative. I believe if we're going to be what God wants us to be in this day, in this time, in this hour, then you and I are going to have to have revival in our personal walk in life. If he doesn't send it to the nation, that's God's business. But what he can do and what is my business is that he can send it into my heart and my life. And as I see a personal revival, it's amazing what God will do. Revival is when the Lord moves in our life and we're not limiting him. We're not holding back. We're not... We're not, we're not turning away on any level of our life. We're coming back to the place of submission to Christ. Where the confession of my lips as well as my heart and my will is that Jesus is Lord. And he's lording in my life and loving through me the world he wants to reach out and wants to love. If you follow Psalm 78, it's about, I've kind of condensed the, the psalm into the, what I would call the indictments against the children of Israel. There were five things that God made statements about and are pretty much repeated throughout the whole psalm. And I use those four verses that I've read this morning because within those four verses is, is kind of the synopsis of the, the what I, we'll just call the five indictments against them. And the five indictments start with this one in verse 41, which we read a while ago. It says, they turn back. They turn back. It literally is a, is the, is the Hebrew word shub, which means to turn away from something but not necessarily with the idea of going back to where you started at. And I think this is the, the indictment against the modern church today. They started well, but somewhere in the process, they turned away. They're no longer walking in obedience. They're, there's no process of discipleship. You know, we've talked about the three tenses of salvation before. If you remember, we talked about I am saved, I am being saved, and I'm going to be saved. Those three tenses, because it is, it inc it's inclusive of all that. I am saved. In 1973, I gave my life to the Lord I, and committed my heart to Christ. And because of that, uh, uh, of Jesus, I am saved, all right? Now, understand, because I am saved, one day, either by death, when I draw my last breath of air and my heart beats that last moment, or by the Lord's coming for me, all right, I am going to be saved. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you are saved. Well, I are. <laughs> Amen. 
That's how I know I are going to be. Yes. All right? I'm going to be because I am. So I am going to be. I'll get my tenses right in a minute, all right? For you English majors, I'm sure this is a bit confusing. <laughs> but the idea is because I have been, I will be. Because it's all inclusive. But that's not the end all, right? In this, this process of I, I have been and I am going to be, there's this what we call the am being. I am being saved. I, I'm allowing God to work in my life. And we've dealt with that a lot of times through the years. But it's not just topical stuff to chew on this morning. It should be an investigation of our hearts to see, well, am I really am being saved? That's what we call a good Bible word, sanctification. Which literally simply means I'm being made more like Jesus Christ. It's a word which has to do with cleansing. And what's it cleansing? It's cleansing me all that old Joe stuff. Yes. And it's washing away so the Jesus stuff can be seen. Amen. The life of Joe diminishes the life of Jesus. Whether John the Baptist said, I must decrease, but he must increase. Amen. That's revival in yes. action. Yes. What happens is that am being saved, it stops. And even though we am been, am going to be, we ain't am being, and we ain't am being, we need revival. <laughs> All right? So that's what it boils back down to. I need God to do something in my life. But what happens is we're supposed to be moving. We're supposed to be moving forward. We're supposed to be being sanctified, that process of our salvation and action, and we just quit. We bail. We stop. Oh, not with the idea of going back to where we were. I ain't going to go back to being a pagan again. That's just, you know, that guy's worthless. But somehow we think that it's okay to kind of just step away. Well, listen, that guy was worthless. Let me remind you, he still is worthless. And any part of him that you go back and try to live from is going to wreck your life. It's just this far, one silly centimeter or whatever away from the cross, you are what you used to be. You may not be doing the same old, same old. It may be manifesting itself in religious pride instead of, you know, drunkenness. But nonetheless, it's just old stinking self. Mm -hmm. So we can't be removed from Jesus. We need Jesus every day, every hour. Amen. I know we've all prayed in, in moments of Christ, but Lord, I need you more than ever. No, you always need him more than ever. Yeah. <laughs> if that makes any <laughs> grammatical sense, I don't know. But you need him as much today as you've ever needed him. You need him when things are good. You need him when things are bad. You need him when things are up. You need him when things are down. You need him when you're healthy. You need him when you're sick. You need him all the time. Amen. Amen. Nothing less, nothing more. You just need him. Amen. But what happens is this slow kind of tidal thing, just kind of like the tide going in and out, and we, ret we turn away from the Lord. Often that's a word which leads to an apostasy. Sometimes the word is used in the context of turning to God when it means to turn. But here's that we are obviously turning away from the Lord. You follow that psalm, it says, The children of Ephraim turn back in the day of battle, is what it goes on to say. The children of Ephraim, that's one of the twelve tribes of Israel. Ephraim is a word which means in the Hebrew language to be twice blessed. It says the twice blessed folks, in other words, they had what they needed. They'd been equipped. They had everything they needed, but they didn't proceed. They got so far and stopped. Where did they stop? When it got going tough. When the difficulties came. In the day of battle. Folks, we are in the day of battle today. It is time to reinforce ourselves with the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in our lives. Take up the shield, take up the sword, and stand and be what God's called us to be. This is no time, like the children of Ephraim, with the blessings of God in our life, to just withdraw. It's time that we say, hey, I need God to move in my life like, it, it, like as much as any other time I've needed God, and I don't need to turn back when things get tough or when the enemy starts fighting back. That's when I need to stand my ground. That's when I need to move forward, but not so with them. The second indictment is this. It says, not only they turn back, it says they tempted God. Now, this is the word which has to do with an annoying test. Let me tell you what it means. It means that, to man to act, that God act on your behalf when these people knew that they weren't right with God. Now, this is the modern contemporary church in America, at least the Western Hemisphere. We kind of have this expectation, since we're the children of God, God just ought to always give us his best. Doesn't matter if we're right, right with him. Doesn't matter if we're walking with him. Doesn't matter if we've got sin in our life. Doesn't matter if we're disobedient to what God's called us to in our life. Well, you know, I love God. God loves me, so God, give me what you got. And if you don't give me God, I'm just going to be upset about it. I'm going to be... I, I've never seen a time in, in, in history, I don't think, at least in my ministry's history, where so many people mad at God. <coughs> Folks, it's not him that abandoned. If the problem, if there is a problem, if there's a shortage, it's not on God's end. 101% of the time, it's on our end. 
God has not failed on any measure in your life. God has not given up on any measure in your life. God's eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth. He's wanting to do something in us. Amen. But yet we approach God with an expectation on Him, but we don't want any expectation on us because we're under grace. <laughs> Boy, what a fallacy. That's not what grace is. The Bible tells us that God's given us and teaches us that grace is that we turn away from ungodliness. Yes. All right, That's what grace is because it gives me the power to turn away. But for me to have expectations of God to meet my need, and I'm a disobedient child, that's a little ludicrous, as ridiculous as it would be in your life when your children, whom you've given specific tasks to accomplish, there are certain expectations as a child in your home that they should have, like respect and honor and, you know, flush the toilet, by the way, and clean your room. Mm -hmm. Just simple actions of respect and obedience, you know, that's like Christians. They, just, they don't want to flush the toilet in their life. They don't leave the mess around. You know, they don't want to show honor and respect. But yet, we want God to do something. You know, I'm going to pray God, you're going to meet my need and deliver me from this and heal my Aunt Nunu or whatever it might be. And we just, we just want, you know, it's like we, we think, and, and a lot of this has come out of the prosperity preachers and teachers of the day. Like God's like our, our heavenly valet. He's our bellboy. Ring his bell. He better get there in a second. If he don't, we're going to go off the corner and we're going to pout. That's what it, this idea of what it means to tempt God. I have expectations that he should do what I tell him to do whenever I tell him to do it. doesn't matter how I'm living my life. The demand of God. The third thing indictment was this, verse 41. We titled the sermon after this part, limiting God. They limited God. They turned back and limited the Holy One of Israel. It may be uh, grieved in your, in your translation. It may be pained in your translation. But literally, it's the idea of the New Testament concept of grieving the Holy Spirit. What grieves the Holy Spirit, and I think this is a good choice of word, of what pains God, so to say, is the fact that we limit God. It means to set a mark, all right? And we'll say, what do you mean? It's like, I know what the Lord wants, and the Lord wants me here at point X, all right? And this is not like the Obama's line in the sand with the Syrians, you know, where he draws the line and the media goes nuts because the Syrians cross the line and, and then the, the administration does nothing. All right, the idea is that there's God, here I am, and I have this little box in here that I expect God to move in. God wants me over here. I don't want to go over there. I'm going just so far, and that's as far as I'm going. I'm not going to cross that line. I set a mark. God hasn't set that mark. He said, well, I don't think I'm limiting God. <laughs> think about this for a moment. How often have we limited God with our puny little thinking? We call it a stinking thinking, you know? How often have we just limited God? Because we have this little box of, of reality, we call it, and, 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 uh, and common sense, that we call it. Here's God out here. He's going to do something big in my life, and my brain's too small to handle it. All right? Because I just refuse to believe it. Here's God wanting to do some spectacular thing in me and with me and through me. He wants me to use me to see people's lives literally transform and change. But, I, you know, I put this limitation. What is it? Oh, that's just not my personality. Or I'm too shy. I'm just, you know, I just don't have, I just not my gift. All that is just, just religious junk and limitations. Well, that's just not me. You know, I've got to be true to myself. <laughs> How's that working out for you? <laughs> you be true to God. God tells you, God says, I want you here. You can't say, oh, that's just too big. That's too, I can't make that. That's a long step, and that's a big, I've got to, Step past that and over it. And usually what that is, by the way, it's just us. Yeah. In our little tiny minds. Yeah. It's, you know. Listen, this whole thing of Christianity is a life of impossibilities. No matter how you look at it, you dissect this Bible, and it's just one impossibility or the other. God's just always asking me to do something I can't do. And God has always seems to be asking me something what I not only can't do, but I don't feel I'm equipped to do. Why me? Why don't you, you know, go tell Brother Tim he's better at that than me. But I'm not telling Brother Tim, I'm telling Brother Joe. <coughs> you understand what I'm saying? How often have you tried to shove that off on somebody else because you didn't think you could handle it or it was too big for you or it wasn't your personality, it wasn't within your, you know, your, your wheelhouse, so to say, and so you said you just push it over there. You're never challenged, you're never tested, you're never drawn out past yourself, and you just miss God. Man, I don't want 
understand that probably this is one of the most dynamic generations that the world in history has ever seen. And we get on the other side of it in the presence of God and see everything God wanted me to do, and I just wouldn't believe him for it. I didn't think I could do that. I didn't think I could do that. You can get, get our heads in the biblical game. Get out of this little thing. You know, how many times did God speak to your heart and Satan's automatically there and he's in agreement with yourself, your old self, saying, oh, yeah, you can't do that. That's too big for you. That's impossible. That's not work. You know, that's not you. That's, there's no way. That's got to be somebody else. And, you know, that, that won't work. Or you can't afford that. Or it's too much. Or it requires too much. It takes too. And you just miss God because of it. We just put these limitations. Now, while everybody's shaking their head yes, let's bring it a little closer into reality. You all love reality, right? Why is it in your home, in your marriage, you won't take the necessary step in your relationship to have the kind of spirit-filled marriage that God wants you to have? Well, it's her fault. Or it's his fault. Or it's my stupid kids. They weren't like that. No, no. See, you put all these little, you've limited God. You've limited God. I was doing some marriage counseling. I usually most of that term. I, I often, too often feel if I do marriage counseling, I try to push you into a referee format, don't they, Tim? Well, what are you telling when you choose this? What are you going to do when he says that? You know, it's kind of like you know, keeping points for him. Is that, so I, you know, that's not my first forte, but I do it. And uh, so we had a really good marriage counselor, you know, with, with this one couple. And talked to them later on the, this week, and they, they said some of our friends out of town, we were with them, they wanted to know, you know, they said, you've gone for marriage counseling. Well, what did he tell you? She said, it's pretty simple. Just get right with God. <laughs> That's really the bottom line in all of it is. In fact, folks, if you just pay attention to what your lift leaders tell you, your pastor tell you, your associate pastor tell you, all the people ministry around you tell you, you wouldn't need half the counseling you think you need. Just do it. So what do we do? We see what the, we see what's required and now then we start putting in the calculator, right? Because the calculator's been programmed with the ability to solve the math problem. Well, this ain't math. All right? This isn't math. This isn't practical. This isn't reality. This is supernatural living. This is spiritual life. And it's outside the, that limited box you're living in. Jump outside this. You know, I think I'm just going to forgive her. No, she doesn't deserve it. She's being nasty. No, he doesn't. He's a, sl he's a slug. I'm going to love him anyway. He doesn't deserve that. Look at what he's acting. You just, just do what God tells you to do. See what God does. Amen. Do what God tells you to do. Just see what God does. Yeah, I don't think God do anything. Well, because he's waiting. He's waiting for you to move. Don't set the mark. You know, the Bible says, and I think it's down in Psalms 84, 86, no good thing will God withhold. Amen. Now, it doesn't stop there, that verse doesn't, but our brain does. Because the rest of the verse says, no good thing will he withhold, the rest of the verse, no period, from them who walk uprightly. Amen. Yeah. In other words, if I just do what God tells me to do, in love, in faith, and trust, and believe, I said, no good thing with hope. We're back there on the other side of the desk, and God, you said you wouldn't withhold anything. Excuse me, don't forget the last part of the verse. You know, part A on the verse is good, but there is the part B. <laughs> God's ready. Now you need to fall in line. It's like that there, another verse there in the Psalm says, you know, it's like, it said, open wide thy mouth, and I will fill it. You can't fill your mouth up. It's shut all the time. And it's shut because you just, you know, you're not moving forward. There's no expectation. There's no hunger. There's no desire. There's no belief. I mean, when you look at all the indictments of the children of Israel, and you look at it in Hebrews, when the writer of Hebrews is kind of summarizing that holy event of Psalm 78, he says they didn't enter in because they had an evil heart of unbelief. He said, that's not why I thought they didn't enter in. You know, they did this, they did this. They had that big nasty thing that went on when Moses was up on the mountain and they were all getting naked and running around. And then they were making golden calves and, you know, and getting drunk and, you know, everybody's getting wasted. And that, that's why, no, said, they did all that because they didn't believe God. As much as they don't do all the other stuff that they should be doing because they don't believe God. And this is, where, this is where, you know, the rubber meets the road for me. This is where God has to back me in a corner and, you know, 
you know, the, there's always a, a verse that remains over my heart and mind all the time. That which teaches that other teaches not thyself also. That, that echoes constantly in my spirit. And I hope it should for all of us. If we're going to tell others how to live their life or the right direction, they, then we ought to be doing it. We ought to be hearing what God's saying. We ought to be challenged to do what God tells us to do. And we ought to rise to the occasion and not put these limitations. The fourth thing is this. I don't think I'll take any more of that one. So I'll move to the next one. It says they turn back. They turn back. Now, this is a different word. This is not like, you say, well, Brother Joe, you said number one was they turn back. This is turn back, but it's a different word in the Hebrew language. The first word was the Hebrew word shub. This is the word sub. And it's the idea, it's twice mentioned here in Scripture, but the idea is that uh, they turn back. Now, the first remember that you're not going to go all the way back to where you started. This word has more to do with just, they just chose to backslide, to willfully disobey what God had told them to do. It's not going to do it. There's, there's a passage in Psalm where it talks, uses this, kind of this context, and it talks about the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways in Proverbs 14. Back to Proverbs 14, 14. And his idea here is that, you know, if your heart's not right with God, sooner or later your heart's going to turn away. This whole thing, remember, always, this, this, this matters of faith and belief and trust, it always gets down to the heart, doesn't it? We don't get saved by our head. We get saved by our heart. The core of who we are. The core of what we are. With our heart, a man believes in the righteous. If you don't know Christ today, there's, there's, not, there's not ten rules you have to follow to get there. Right. There's not do's and don'ts and, you know, some kind of spiritual algorithm that God's come up with that leads to <laughs> salvation. No, it's, it's a simple matter of putting your heart in God's hand and saying, here's my life. I'm going to follow you. Amen. But now once we made the decision to follow him... What happens? We stop following at times, and that's when the need for revival comes in our life. Real, genuine revival. And we can't just let our hearts be enamored by the world, by the things of the world. We, we can't put God in that little box. We have to come back and say, listen, I don't want to draw back in my heart. I want to draw near to you. In fact, this word soon is, it has the idea of disloyalty to it. We just become loyal to our, our flesh or to the world or to other things. The bottom line, it needs to be untrustworthy. In other words, you, you can't be trusted. You can't be trusted. And I, I really believe God doesn't give some things to some folks because he can't trust them with them. Because they've not been trustworthy. But isn't that what Jesus taught? He said, listen, if you'll be faithful in a little, I'll make you master of much. Just be faithful. You know, we can't even be faithful to read our Bible. We can't be faithful to share Christ. We, we can't be faithful to come to church. We wonder why we're just seem to be at such this, this, this there's this there's this emptiness over here. We don't well. I know I'm a Christian, but I don't know what's wrong. I just don't want to feel sense God's presence in my life. I don't. I, where where's the shortage? It's, again, it's not with God, is it? So revival means we we, we get honest. I mean, gut wrenching honest about our attitude, about our relationships, about where our heart's been and what our affections are and where our love has been. Honest about the things we say, the things we do, the things we watch, what we entertain by. And we become trustworthy. We've been given one of the greatest treasures in the world, each one of us individually. Not just the life of Christ in me, but we've been given this pearl of, of great pride. We've been given the gospel. One thing I'm super excited about is our next study that we're going to be starting in October with our lift group. We have a little word at the end of the service on it again, but, you know, share Jesus without fear. You, you've been given this precious gospel jewel. And let me put it this way. You've been given a trust with the gospel. But what are we doing with that trust? What are we doing with what God has entrusted to our care and to our stewardship? How, how are we being trustworthy? We're not. I mean, it's kind of like, I, I think God's given us some real clear indicators of, of way things are. You know, one of the clear indicators is what we do with our time. You know, how do I spend my time? What's important about it? Mm -hmm. Another is our treasures, you know, what God has given me. I mean, we're saying, I want God to bless me, bless me, bless me, and we're so tight, we squeak when we walk. You know, we can't give God $5 tip when the offering comes, you know. <laughs> we, we, get all, we get all bent out of shape, but the pastor talks about money. And stewardship. Well, you know, you, 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 you talk about money all the time. No, you're hearing the Holy Ghost talk to you about money all the time. I don't talk about money all the time. You go back and listen to my sermons over the last several years. All right? 
But you know every time you get in church, the Spirit's prompting you to be obedient with the trust that God's given you, which is the wealth He's placed in your hands. It might not be much. It might be more if you'd be trustworthy. But if you're going to gripe about over a small portion, you're going to gripe about a dime on a dollar, you've got problems. Let me say that again. If you're going to gripe about a dime on a dollar, you've got issues. You're a tightwad. You're greedy. And if you're not greedy, you're covetous. If you're not covetous, then you're just ignorant. I just say stupid. There's a difference. Some of you are stupid, all right, but some of you are stupid. We just, we, just, we just failed. God said he'd do this. Cast your bread upon the water, many days will return to you. What's that mean? That mean go out and buy yourself a loaf of Miss Bears and throw it on the Lake Conroe. <laughs> All right, come back. I'll come back a week later and get some soggy bread back. No. No. You faithful and little, master over much. It's a principle. And money is just one way that we can help gauge where we're really at. You know? And some of you say, well, you know, I. I, I don't give like that. I give my time to the Lord. Well, that's good. Then you're, then you're right in your time, but you're still wrong in your money. Yeah. Well, you know, I serve the Lord. I, I, I do that. I've had people tell me, I serve the Lord. I, I, I help in the band, or I, I, I pray, or, you know, and I teach a Bible study. That's, that's my gift to the church. Well, that's your time gift, but it's not your treasure gift. Yeah. So you're way behind. Amen. That's right. Amen. The Lord said you could borrow it. In Exodus, I think it was, or in Leviticus, there's a formula there. But I think the interest rate's like 33 and a third percent, so you might want not. <laughs> that would kill you in the end. It ain't the Sears Easy payment plan. What, what was that? It's, it, just, it's, it just indicates where our heart's at, right? Amen. You know, I've always discovered when revival comes, money is never the issue. Right. Yeah. You know, I used to have preachers call me all the time, want me to come do revivals in the churches and say, how much do you want? He said, whatever God gives. He said, what do you mean? We have a budgeted amount. So I can't come for a budgeted amount. <laughs> well, why not? It's a big amount. He said, it's not enough. He said, what do you mean? Said, you just let me come. I'll preach. If God moves, you take an offering. God moves, they'll take care of the need. And it always does. Yeah. It always did. Yeah. Okay, and it's amazing. We have some pastors, can't they? I'll attest to this. We have pastors be so scared during the week that the offering wasn't going to be big enough. They come back every night. I just don't know, Brother Joe, about this offering this week. But hey, when God shows up, it'll be okay. Amen. I mean, we had some. I'm serious. This is such a big issue in churches and some people's life. It's 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 like the circus coming to town when God shows up. Everybody gets all excited. I mean, we had a guy called. He, he took the last offering to the service. He ran out while I'm preaching to count the offering. He still prayed it wasn't going to be enough. I mean, if the service was over, he called a church wide meeting. Don't take another offering. I told you I believe God more came in. Well, he wasn't. He was just having revival because the offering was so big. You know? Now before it had been just a couple hundred bucks. And then now it was several thousand dollars. I said, well, I thought, Tom, you don't have to have a church meeting over this. And, you know, <laughs> just praise the Lord. God's going to meet the need. Do you realize it's the same in your life? If you give God the opportunity and you give God the opportunity by just being faithful and obedient and trustworthy, that he'll do what needs to be done in your life? Do you not believe that God's big enough to meet your needs? I mean, if you don't believe God's big enough to meet your needs, how are you even trusting him you're going to get out of hell? That's a whole lot bigger than your light bill. It's a whole lot bigger than your house payment, getting out of hell. That's a bigger pay, payment to make. It's one you can't make. But you're going to trust God to get you out of hell, but you can't trust him with your substance. You need to get your thinking straight. You with me? Say, uh-huh. Yeah. We're going to number... <laughs> you skip number the next slide and go to number five. Go ahead. Skip, 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 skip. They, they took all my time up on the other one. <laughs> the other one says that he, God turned them aside, basically, like a deceitful bow. A deceitful bow is a bow that's just slack. There's no power anymore. You can pull it back, and it's not going to hit the target because it's gone slack. And when a bow goes deceitful, there's three things about it. We said on that slide, there's no power in it anymore. There's no, no purpose for it anymore, but there's no power in it, and there's no pleasure in it. I don't want to be that way with God. I don't want to be a deceitful bow. Amen? Neither do you, do you? Not a one of us want to be that way. The last and the fifth thing is and they dealt unfaithfully. That's a Hebrew word by God. And it's used 42 times. It's used many more times. 
but 42 times specifically in the Old Testament in reference to marriage. Somebody that's unfaithful in their marriage relationship. And it's a word which has to do with a covert, a secret deception. In other words, you're cheating, but your spouse doesn't know it. I have no idea. I'm cheating. But understand, your heavenly spouse we are the church. He's the groom. We're the bride. He knows. Amen. And we may cover it really well in our spiritual life and be cheating on Jesus. Cheating with our flesh, cheating with the world, cheating on some level. We're just choosing to do what our will is instead of God's will is. We're not being faithful to God. And we're like that unfaithful spouse. How many times you've seen that take place? You get so disappointed in someone when you find out they've been cheating on their bride. For whatever reason, what happens is, with all five of these, there's this line that's drawn in our life, and, you know, the potential for us is disastrous. Not in a good, it's a bad, disastrous, when we do this with God. The Bible tells us not to love this world or the things that are in this world. Any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it. That's why it gets back even to giving. Some people can easily, you know, they have trouble going out and buying the giant screen TV, the brand new car, but they're not going to give faith to the Lord. Why? Because they love the world more than they love the Word. Yeah. Simply put. Now, folks, if you want candy on Sunday morning from the pulpit, there's some churches that will just sugar you right up. And I like sugar. Do you like sugar? I love... I love Shipley's sugar for some reason. I don't know what it is about their sugar, but when they take that sugar and spray it on hot dough, that's like manna from heaven. Am I right? Can I get a witness? But if I eat that stuff all the time, well, you know what happens. I just lost about 25 pounds of it recently. It was all Shipley's. Every pound fell off me like another half dozen donuts went away. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. I love it, though, but I, I, I don't need it. Yeah. Somebody told me that if the FDA had to approve sugar, refined processed sugar today is an item to be consumed by the American public, it would never pass FDA because it's so deadly and causes so many problems and hurts us in so many different ways. I sure love it. <laughs> we have to make a sense who we love the most, though, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of preaching today that's sugar. There's a lot of churches today. But I hope that when you come to Believer's Fellowship on any given Sunday that you're at Believer's Fellowship, you hear a word that challenges you. Yes. And that encourages you. Say, I want to be what God wants yes. me to be. Yes. I don't want to be ridiculously, insanely stupid in my spiritual life. Yes. And if I'm being that way, I need somebody to grab me up by the nap, nap of the neck and shake my collar a little bit. Say, hey, don't go there. Don't be that way. Live for Jesus. There's a better life. Yes. What we all need in our spiritual life. Yes. Well, I'm asking and believing and trusting and controlling and any way I can to encourage you to say, hey, don't sad, be satisfied with anything less than what God has for you. Don't be satisfied with anything less than real revival in your life. I pray to God we would see a national revival, but if we don't, let it begin right here in me. Amen. Amen. I want to experience what God has for you. And if I don't, another moment of truth, it's usually just because I'm making excuses in some regard. It's like a lot of people don't experience the fullness in their marriage. Why? They're too busy making excuses for not doing it God's way. Yeah. People don't experience the fullness of God in their finances. They're too busy making excuses for why they don't do it. People don't experience the fullness in some area in their life, in their family, in their, in their children, because they're too busy making excuses not doing it God's way. Well, I would but, or I would this but, or I'm just but, you know, I'd but Joe but. It's just, I, how many times I've sat in meetings, and I've sat in revivals, and I've sat in, in, in counseling sessions where it's just but, 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 but. Just get off your big butt <laughs> and move forward to the possibility that God's ready to do something in your life and say, hey, you know, well, I haven't got anything to lose. Amen. I think I believe God. Amen. I'm going to try this God's way. Mm -hmm. 
Marriage God's way. Money God's way. Work God's way. Life God's way. And see what God has to do. And what God will do in your life. I think that God is up to something in all my heart. I cannot believe that we're living in the day that we're living in with all the manifestations and all the prophetic signs that are bounding on every hand. That God, at the very same time, God's not wanting to do a great work in our lives and through our lives to reach other people's lives. Amen. These are good days. But if we don't have revival, we'll miss them. These are good times. We don't need to make excuses, though. I don't, you know, it's, it's the old thing you've heard all the time. You know, excuses are like armpits, you know? You, you got two of them, and they both stink. <laughs> That's what it always boils down to. It just, it just, it just, they're just worthless. And I want you to know, I don't know about you, I can come up with some good excuses. Amen. And I understand. I've listened to a lot of years. And you come up with some pretty good excuses. <laughs> but let's remember the simile and the metaphors. Oh, God's got something higher, farther, bigger, stronger, and deeper for your life. Yeah. Get on board. Yeah. Don't settle for mediocrity. Whatever it is in your life that God wants to deal with, I can guarantee you, if you're in this room and you're a Christian, he's probably already shown you what it is. All right, he's probably already told you that. Deal with that. Start there. Just deal with that. Confess that to the Lord. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Would you just start right there today? And let God lead you the rest of this way. He says, Lord, this is where it's at. This is what I've done. Or this is what I've said. This is the way I've behaved. This is the way I've acted. This is what, where I'm guilty. Of. And I just, I need your forgiveness. Lord. I'm not going to say, Lord, forgive me. I'd sin because of God. It's their fault. No. This is what I did. I'm responsible. This is what I didn't do. I'm responsible. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me. And see what the Lord does in your life. And you leave here today in your life. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Our Father is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has he is not changed one bit. What God has been for, He is still for. If God was ready to move in your life yesterday, He's still ready to move in your life today. That passage in 2 Chronicles that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth means he's running his eyes through this room tonight. Yes. Looking for a heart that's pure. Only one thing makes you pure. That's the blood of Jesus. Amen. Would you commit that and confess that to the Lord Jesus Christ? Let him deal with that. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And I ask you, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would somehow move in our hearts in such a genuine way that we can see that you're looking to us. We can know you're speaking to us. And that, Father, we'd have such clarity of thought and mind we wouldn't be looking for a reason not to do what you call us to. We'd be looking for the reason to believe it. Draw us to yourself. Draw us by your Holy Spirit. Speak to us this day. Your head's bowed just for a moment. The Lord's speaking to you. I know we're a little crowded in this room. Why don't you just make your way down somewhere around this altar, around this stage this morning. If you can't kneel, then just stand here and trust the Lord today. Ask Him to send that revival in your life. Ask Him to speak to you on that, that level and in that way in your life. Ask Him to minister His grace, His peace, and His forgiveness to you this morning in a way that will honor Him. And you'll walk out here right with the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, any one of these men in the altar today, you can come to and let us share with you how you can know Christ Jesus personally. If you're looking for a church home, you believe this is where the Lord is calling you. You believe this is where the Lord is calling you. And I encourage you today to come, let one of these men know that you desire to be a part of this church and this fellowship. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, here we are. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our lives. Let's respond to the Holy Spirit this morning. Let's sing it. You are me with a melody. You surround me with a song. I will deliver from my enemy.
sermons like this, how important it is that we respond to whatever the Holy Spirit is saying. Because when we reject it, one or two things happens. You know, I mean, we can accept it and become more sensitive. Sanctification is working in our heart, make us more like Christ. Or tragically, we become harder if we do not. And ask the Lord to guard what He said to you. Help you to implement that seed of truth into your life. Welcome him. Whatever he's saying, you welcome him. Say, yes, Lord, I receive what you're saying. I receive what you're doing. Father, we thank you for truth. Yes. Thank you for speaking to our hearts and our lives. We thank you for the word, God, which literally transforms us. We ask you to take this word now. We leave this place today. We'd use it. Not only touch our lives, but touch someone else's life. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Somebody say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord a little bit. Or you praise the Lord more than that. Amen. amen. A couple things I just want to remind you of. One, uh, is our, this Friday night, we're going to be having our men's dinner. You should have gotten a handout, man, when you came in today. You didn't be sure to grab one on the way out. But on the bottom of that is your reservation form, so to say, all right? If you're coming, we need to know about it. Number one, we need you to come. Now, I don't know if we're going to meet up here. We're going to meet in the lobby. And I don't think the fellowship hall is going to be done. But we'll find we're going to meet somewhere at this facility. We may meet outside. Who knows? Amen? But we'll have a, a, a functional meeting place for our dinner together. But you don't want to miss. We had to put this off not too long ago because of something called Harvey and some other stuff that's going on, things like that, just kind of messing things up and pushing it down. Uh, Perry's going to be speaking to us. You don't want to miss. You haven't had the opportunity to get to know Perry to give you a real opportunity to get to know him a little bit better. I believe he's got a word for you, gentlemen, and for me, I'm going to be here. So get that sign. Find that form. Just don't stick in your Bible. Don't expect your wife. She's not your mama, all right? <laughs> Fill it out yourself. All right? Be the big boy. Get a pen. Write your name on it. And... <clears throat> Turn that form in. I'm expecting a big, big group for this Friday night dinner. We're going to have a good fellowship, man. Everyone's, guys, we just need to get together, amen, encourage one another. So all you men are going to be there, say amen real loud. Amen. 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 If you heard then, that means you're going to be there too. So come on, be a part of it. It's going to be a great, great time with the Lord. And like I said, the Lord, let me just spend some time together. Share where we're at, what's going on, what days are expected ahead of us, all right? Because there's a lot going on. We need to have some more work days coming up pretty soon. The auditorium is painted. The floors are done, the chairs are cleaned back up and sanitized and all that stuff. Uh, this week they finish in there, so don't go romping around in there just yet, all right? Because the stuff's still spread out. They come in, they finish all the carpeting on the stage. We had to remodel the stage, so they're finishing that work in the sound booth. So uh, just uh, 
you know, hopefully next Sunday we'll be in there. All right, back for our, our regular service and bring our folks back over. Magnolia will be going out there and bring our folks from downstairs. You get to come back to the worship service. We'll go down there with them, amen. But uh, get back everybody together, one, one, one accord in one place, amen, like I said in the book of Acts. So this, I'm looking forward to being back in there. Praise the Lord, this, you know, as miserable as it's been, it's been a real opportunity to freshen up the place in a lot of good, good ways. So those of you who showed up, points down, I can't say thank you enough. You showed up yesterday and did the cleaning, and I you know, appreciate you being here. And Cheryl has a, just getting everything cleaned up. And we've got three or four ladies extra that helped show up and helped us clean up. So uh, there'll be some more days like that, at least another one for the lobby, and then we're going to do some more days in the fellowship hall, getting it back to order. And then a few more weeks it's going to take. We may need some more cleaning days to help get the, the offices put back together and back in place. Texturing's all been done. The sheetrock's all been done. Tape look all been done. Now the painters come in on Monday, the carpet layers for the stage and the auditorium. The painters get through next week downstairs we're going to paint everything, and we'll come back in with the carpet. So we may even have the nursery ready next Sunday. I'm not sure. If not, the nursery will still be back up here, but the worship services will be downstairs. All right? Somebody say amen. amen. Is that good? Yes. Amen. 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 Those of you who are guests of ours, thanks for being here. I'll be down in the lobby briefly after the service. Love to meet you. And be a, uh, love to meet you personally and shake hands. Thanks for being part of the Believer's Fellowship Worship Service. Uh, come if you've been watching my Facebook today. If uh, Hey, come to church if you can. Come in and be a part of what God's doing here. We'd love to have you in the services. You can find everything going on on our website. Also, did I say anything about offerings yet? Uh, let me remind you of your opportunity to give. There's receptacles at that exit and that exit. And there's one by the main stair, uh, downstairs by the main doors. In the middle is another box there. So, gentlemen, I'm going to put uh, your tithes and offerings in. Put your dinner registration in as well. Amen. Amen. We have a, oh, watch this. This changed a lot right here. One of the great things about Bill's method is it's so easy to ask those five questions once you get over the fear that the other person is going to think that they're strange. I've been asking them ever since Bill taught us this, which must be, I don't know, 16 years ago. And it's, it's so easy to weave them into a conversation. I think when you're witnessing and using that method, it's so easy, I think, once you get the hang of it, once you practice it so much. It's almost really easy to, to come up to anybody and and, and, uh, and and open up with these questions and probe to find out where they are. A lot of people, um, even in, when you're in situations where you're just at a bus stop like myself, and uh, I've seen a church cross street, and I asked the guy, yeah, have you been to the church? He said, no. I said, well, have you ever been to church? No. So do you have any spiritual beliefs? No. Then we go. But we're in there, and it works. and. Sometimes I'll just find out how much time we have, and I'll go through the whole thing with him. Other times I just get the chance to go ahead and unravel or put in his mind something to think about, and that's exciting. I couldn't believe how simple it was to be able to talk about my faith and to share with someone else how they too can know Jesus Christ. And God began to just do some incredible things. In fact, immediately after that presentation, I went back to work and actually tried it, almost daring myself, and that day my supervisor, my manager, and several customers all gave their lives to Jesus Christ. It's very much like in medicine that you really can't know anything in terms of what's an effective treatment unless you have the diagnosis. And one example of this is a fellow by the name of Lewis who was a stockbroker for Charles Schwab that I went in one morning to just make an investment uh, and I, I went into his, the office there and uh, Lewis was the next person up so I went in and we started sort of talking about the investment and, and then I said by the way Lewis do you have any kind of spiritual beliefs and here's a guy that's a stockbroker you think well he's a, so he probably has it all together uh, I see him look like, like he's very successful and he said well Paul, well, Paul I, I, I don't have any spiritual beliefs myself he said, I'm kind of looking to know God. And I, I never would have gotten that from him had I not asked him that question. And I said, do you believe in heaven or hell? And he said, uh, yeah, I think that there's a heaven and a hell. To you, who is Jesus? And he said, uh, I really don't know, but I'd like to learn. 
And so um, I said, well, why don't we go? Because it was a very busy office. And I said, Louis, why don't we go to lunch next week? I'll give you a call and we can really discuss it. And so I took him to lunch about a week later and we continued with those, with the diagnostic questions and then got into looking at the scripture the same way. What does this say? What does this mean to you? What does the Bible say? Not, this is what I believe, this is my theory, but what does the Bible say? You tell me. And then step by step, within a couple of weeks, Lewis came to understand the gospel, prayed with me to receive the gospel, and really has been growing. I've been working with him the last year uh, to help him to grow in Christ. Amen. Wouldn't you like to be given that testimony of people that you share the gospel with? Yes. You say, well, I'm fearful. That's why we're offering Share Jesus Without Fear, an eight-week study that will begin on October 1st in lift groups. If you're not in a lift group, you won't know it. What a commitment we should all have to say. You know, it's just fear. It's really not, will I learn how to do it? It's just, I'm fearful too. This will give you the confidence to show you a presentation with a few questions, no scripture memory. He shows you how you can take your Bible and walk right through it. We want everybody to be able to go through this Share Jesus Without Fear series. So be planning. Uh, we have morning lift groups. If that schedule works better for you, we have evening lift groups that work better for you. You pick one. You get plugged in. Uh, downstairs is on the website. All of our lift groups, where they're located, what times. Be sure to be planning on October 1st to be in a lift group and find out how you can share Jesus without fear. Amen? So we're trusting God for that. Uh, also, the uh, mentoring class coming up. Laurel, where are you supposed to give a... There you go. Uh, come on up here and uh, what you share with us about the mentoring class that's, that's coming up. You know, all week I've been praying, asking God, what do I say? I've been doing this for a long time. What new can I say? What words to draw? I feel like Brother Joe said everything I need to say. I woke up this morning, and the first thing the Holy Spirit said to me was, for such a time as this. I thought, well, Brother Joe just used that. But that's what the Lord say, said to me. He told me to be faithful no matter what. And this is a time, an opportunity for the women of our church that can come and have someone come alongside of them and encourage them in their everyday walk. And with that, you can learn about the Lord, too, and be encouraged in the Lord. Who wouldn't want that? Tomorrow night at my house, I have um, a coffee, and it explains absolutely everything that the ministry is about. So it's an opportunity at that point for you to come and be a part of the ministry. I want to encourage you. So I know we're going through an awful lot right now. And I know Brother Joe says we may not have a decade left. Before the Lord returns, what an opportunity to be able to have someone come alongside of you. You don't have to have the answers because the Lord knows them. And encourage someone. So I know we're all going through things. If you've got, it doesn't take a lot of time. Come and check me out tomorrow night. I'll be downstairs with the table. Let me know if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you all. Praise the Lord. Also, the Journey 101 class is coming up on Sunday, October the 8th at 4 o'clock. Uh, there's sign-up cards for that uh, down at the Welcome Center. Uh, fill out one of those and drop that in one of the offering boxes. That's the 101. That's the, the membership class. So if you haven't taken that class since becoming a member or if you think, well, I would be interested in maybe becoming a member or I'd like to know more about the church to be praying about becoming a member, Sign up for the 101 class. Again, it will be held on October the 8th at 4 o'clock. We'll watch your children. We'll do whatever we need to do. But be sure to sign up for that 101 class. You'll be blessed. Brother Joe teaches that class, and uh, you'll, you'll have a great time there. So if you haven't taken 101, sign up today, and then we'll be sending you a reminder about that. Also, there's no evening services tonight, the last Sunday of the month. Be sure to mark that. That down. There's also pantry items, food pantry items back here in the back that you'll need, need to take advantage of that. Uh, Brother Joe mentioned the men's dinner. Uh, the date's on the screen and the date's on the handout or right. It's just the monitor downstairs was off. Just go by what was up here and what's on your handout. It is the date that he said it, October the 6th. So, uh, uh, Also, the sermon that you just heard is uh, 
That's a, you can take that and link that to your Facebook, share that with all your Facebook contacts so that they can hear, all your friends can hear the message that you just heard. So take advantage of that. We have that available since it's already been put on the, on the YouTube and on our, you can link it also on our website. So share it with all your Facebook contacts and get the word out, get the message out, and they can hear the same message you did. And that's another valuable tool that we have here to be able to spread the word to all those around us. Uh, also, we have a decision that we want to share with you. Uh, Sandy, won't you stand up here? And Brenda, you'll stand up here with um, Sandy is making her commitment here to be recommitted to the Lord Jesus Christ and make that public. And she just wants to make that decision. She's recommitting her life to Christ, and so we're happy for her decision to do that, make that public. And uh, this is Karen Ballsworth's sister, as uh, we've been praying for her and as well. So uh, let uh, Sandy know how happy you are for her decision. We may just have her stand outside right there since we're kind of crowded right here, and be sure to. Come by and tell Sandy how happy you are about her decision. Uh, all the other things are in your bulletin. Take note of that. Hold on to your bulletin during the week, and you'll see all the things. Be reminded of everything that's going on as well. Amen. Praise the Lord. We'll see you. God bless you.